Welcome you to the conversation today. My name is Daryl Arnez and I am with Freedom Creation. And I have a word that I want to share with you tonight. It's actually part of a series of teachings that I'm doing um, entitled 2024, the year of the global reset. I wanted to share this message with you because I believe it is a very important message for us to understand um, at this given time in prophetic history. So before we go into the teaching, let's just have a word of prayer and let's acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit who is the teacher uh, to give us insight, to give us revelation and to give us clarity of thought. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us an understanding of your eternal plan and your eternal purpose. Father, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who was promised to lead and to guide us into all truth. And Father, we pray that the listeners would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power of the blood, the forgiveness of sin, and the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. What I want to talk to you about is, is something that I am sure most of you have heard about within your Christian journey. And even if you're not a believer, I'm sure that some of the things that we talk about tonight is going to be familiar um, to you as things that you've heard relative to biblical prophecy. Now, I do want to say at the outset is that when I look at biblical prophecy, I'm actually viewing history as it was foretold by the prophets and the apostles um, in the text. So I'm not dealing with a lot of sensationalism. I'm not trying to attach biblical significance to individuals. Um, that has been done over and over and over again. But what I want to do is I want to look at something in the book of Revelation in dealing with the beast, in dealing with the mark of the beast, and dealing with the image of the beast. Now, as I said um, in the class over and over and over again, that when we talk about the mark of the beast, many times people try to attach a meaning to a symbolism without understanding the other part of the symbolism. In other words, Many people have tried to define what the mark of the beast is without being clear about what the beast is or who the beast is. So these are some of the things um, that I want to look at tonight. And I think it's very significant um, in light of our present um, political, social, and economic challenges that we face uh, in 2024 and beyond. So I'm, I'm just simply going to ask that you, you listen with an open mind. Um, you may have to go back and listen to the message again, but take your, take your scriptures. I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the scriptures for everything that we're talking about. And I want you to, to be like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are so. So I don't expect you uh, just to take what I say and say, well, it was put together well, it makes sense, and so it must be true. No, I want you to take the information that I'm sharing, take it before the Father, lay it before the Father, and ask the Spirit of God to give you an understanding and to yea or nay, the information that I'm giving you. So that's that's my intent 
So to begin, I want to look at the book of Revelation, and we're going to read uh, chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple of verses in, uh, in this chapter, and then we're going to kind of lay some groundwork into the historical background of the text that we're looking at. But in Revelation chapter 13, uh, John the Revelator was writing and he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This portion of Revelation 13 is packed. It's, it's, it's literally packed. And in those seven verses, what we actually have is a picture of world history as it relates to the journey and the experience of the people of God. Now, we, we've learned in other teachings that the use of beast in prophetic scripture is not talking about literal beasts that come up. So this is not science fiction. This is not, you know, the stuff that they make in movies when they try to put out a movie about uh, the apocalypse. No, these bees in prophetic scripture are clearly defined elsewhere in the word of God. Now, this beast that we see in verse one is rising up out of the sea. He has seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Now watch this. The bees, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now we're going to go back into the prophet Daniel, and we're going to see this same beast it is in the prophecies of Daniel that these beasts are defined so we will know what these beasts are and what their place in prophetic history actually is. But I want to point out before we go to Daniel, I want to point out something because it says in verse 4, they worshipped the dragon. So we have this picture of a beast rising up out of the sea, but we also have the imagery of a dragon as well. 
It also says that the dragon gave unto this beast his seat, his power, and great authority. Now, if we look at Revelation chapter 12, just one chapter before, we see another reference to a dragon. And this is the story of the woman that was clothed with the sun, had the moon under her feet. She gave birth to a man child and a dragon, verse four of Revelation 12, stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. But it says in verse 17 that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This woman in Revelation chapter 12 is symbolic of the people of God, whether we're talking Old Covenant Israel or New Covenant Israel. Old Covenant Israel gave birth to the Messiah, the man-child who was to rule all nations. Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, was caught up unto God and to his throne. The woman now that gave birth to the child, this is New Covenant Israel, fled into the wilderness, the dragon, that old serpent called the devil. So that's who the dragon is representative of, is the serpent who we know is the enemy of God and the enemy of God's people. He's wroth with the woman, so he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's the believers. That's the people of God. The woman flees into what is described as the wilderness, which kind of gives us a picture of old covenant Israel journeying through the wilderness when they came out of Egypt and they had to face all of these enemies on the way to the promised land. You remember that? See, the language of the book of Revelation points back to other events in the history of the people of God so we can understand what the Spirit of God is showing us relative to the journey of the people of God over time. Did you catch that? If you didn't catch it, rewind it, go back and listen to it again. That's the dragon. So we've identified who this dragon is, this serpent, that gave his power unto this beast. Now let's define who the beast is that John saw coming up out of the sea that had seven heads and ten horns. So I want you to hold your place there in the book of Revelation, and I want you to go back to the book of Daniel, and we want to look in the book of Daniel at Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we read this, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, and it's interesting that this is taking place in Babylon, because we know in the book of Revelation, as we get further into the book, we hear about Babylon again. Mystery Babylon. You all remember that. Okay. That Babylon talked about in the book of Revelation is not the historic empire or nation of Babylon. It's symbolisms. It is alluding back to something that has already occurred, but we know it will reemerge in the end time and will be the challenge not only of the people of God, but of the inhabitants of the earth. All right. So we have Babylon. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream.
and visions of his head were upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Now watch this. Daniel spoke and said, I see in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. So we have the sea again. Remember the beast rose up out of the, out of the sea, the first beast. Now watch. Four great beasts came up from the sea, different one from another. The first beast was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. And I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked up and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given unto it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, arise and devour much flesh. So after this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leper, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And this I saw in the night visions, and behold, now watch this, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, if we compare Daniel chapter 7 to Revelation 13 and these beasts, we see something. Daniel saw four beasts. The first was like a lion. The second was like a bear. The third was like a leopard. And then the fourth was a nondescript beast. But he does say it had ten horns. Are you with me? Revelation 13 in describing the beast that John saw. Now watch this now. He said, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. It had the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. They are literally seeing the same beast, but they're seeing them in reverse order. Did you get that? Okay, well, now watch. He said, this beast, what he defines first, it, it was like a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave unto him his power and great authority, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Daniel sees the beast. First beast is a leopard, second is a bear, third is a leopard. When John saw it, it was like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. Same exact beast, but they're seeing them in reverse order. Why? This fourth beast in the book, or this beast in this beast in the book of Revelation is a conglomerate. It's, it's, it's pulling all of that history together into one, but it's the same nations. It's the same kingdoms, if you will. Daniel is looking down through history. He sees a lion, bear, leopard. John is looking back in history and he sees this beast as leopard, bear, lion. Why? Because he's looking at the history of these nations backwards. Daniel is looking at their history looking forward. Stay with me now. Okay, let's go back to Daniel. Now he says this. 
I consider, he says in verse 8, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them, among these ten horns, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And I beheld to the thrones were cast down, ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. Same description we see of the Almighty in the book of Revelation. But I want to show you how the angel reveals to Daniel what these beasts represent. So let's go down to verse 15 of Daniel 7. This is all foundation. This is all the background. He says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my, in, in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. So I came near unto one of them that stood by, these angels, he's, he's in vision, he's getting an angelic revelation, and he asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and he made me know the interpretation of the things. Now, the angels are going to give Daniel an understanding of the vision of these beasts, what these beasts are so that we as the people of God don't have to guess. It's clear in the scriptures what these beasts represent. And I submit what they represent in the book of Daniel is the same thing that they represent in the book of Revelation. Okay, here we go. He said, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which will arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceeding dreadful and whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than their fellows. Verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all kingdoms, and he'll devour the earth and break in pieces and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he will subdue three kings. So, clearly in Daniel, these beasts represent kings. If you read earlier prophecies in the book of Daniel, we'll find, you'll, you'll see Kings represent the empire or the kingdom over which they rule and reign. It has already been given to Nebuchadnezzar an understanding that his vision, you remember the image of gold, breasts of silver, breasts, waist of bronze, legs of iron, had 10 toes, and he defined them as the four great kingdoms that will arise in the earth, beginning with Babylon, Medo-Persia, the third is Greece, the fourth was Rome. With the fall of Rome, we have the divided Roman Empire or the ten kingdoms that grew out of Rome that become really modern-day Europe, the, the European kingdoms, the Suave, uh, the French, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Harulu, the Huns, you know, all of that history. Those barbarian tribes that came down at the fall of the Roman Empire and divided up Rome. 
Now, interestingly, you'll remember that when Rome fell or when Greece fell, Alexander the Great, he conquered the world very swiftly. He moved with rapid speed like a leopard. And he had three ribs in his mouth. These are <laughs> the, those nations that made up the Greek Empire. When, when he died, because Daniels or Revelations and Daniels says that this, this beast had four heads, the leper, verse 6, which had upon his back four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. You'll remember that when Greece fell, there was no ruler that succeeded, or when Alexander died, there was no ruler that succeeded Alexander. History tells us that Greece was divided up among Alexander's four generals. Just check your history books. Prophecy is accurate. World history is foretold through biblical prophecy. But we have to stick with the symbolisms and the descriptions of the symbolisms that are given to us in Scripture. Then we can look historically to the fulfillment of those events. This is where much of our modern day understanding of biblical prophecy goes awry because they, they, they try to make stuff up instead, instead of doing like the Protestant reformers did and search the scriptures and understand historically what's taking place. Okay, that's the fourth beast. The fourth beast that is being described in the book of the revelation is a conglomeration of Babylon, Greece, Persia, and Rome. All of that is made up and coalesces into what we know historically as the Roman Empire, the empire of Rome. I'm talking about pagan Rome, and I'm making the distinction for a reason. So that gives us, hopefully, an understanding of this beast in the book of Revelation. So that's who that beast is representative of. It's giving us some information about Rome. Now, something happened with the fall of the Roman Empire. When Rome fell, okay, if you'd like the study notes for this, send me an email and, and I'll get you the study, the study notes of this because this is what we find out. There is a deadly wound, Revelation 13. This beast, verse 3, I saw as it were one of his heads as if it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Now remember, when Rome fell, it was divided up into 10 kingdoms, not empires. It was divided into 10 kingdoms. But Daniel says, as he was looking at the horns, behold, another little horn came up among them and devoured three of the 10. Now, if you, again, if you check history and you look at the history of papal Rome, what you will discover in order for pagan Rome to transfer power to papal Rome, in order for the Bishop of Rome to take control of what was the then known Christian world in the West, he had to uproot three of those kingdoms because they would not submit to his authority. Just check your church history. I'm not making stuff up. Check your church history. Three of those kingdoms were plucked up because they would not accept the doctrines of papal Rome. Okay, stay with me. But it says, this beast 
has a deadly wound. The influence, now here we go, the influence of Rome, because this is who we're talking about. The influence of Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed. Now, this will make sense the further we go. Prophecy foretells that Rome, papal Rome, will again have its power and authority restored. Now, I know somebody is saying, what does this have to do with Revelation 13? Stay with me. He says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and that deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. We're going to look at this deadly wound that Rome suffered. We're going to look at how that wound will be healed. And we are also going to see how the next beast that we read in Revelation 13 that rose up out of the earth caused the world to make an image to the beast. Stay, stay with me now. Stay, stay with me. All right. The influence of Rome that it once held will regain its power. So let me go here. Let me go here. Let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. It says this. All that dwell upon the earth will worship him. Who? The beast. The beast power. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When it's all said and done, there's going to be two groups of people. There are going to be those who worship God, those who worship the image of God. We know Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And there will be those that worship the beast. That's it. The issue is going to boil down to the issue of worship. It always has been the issue of worship. Going back to Cain and Abel, it's always been the issue of worship. So it says this, verse 9, If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast. Now this is another book, another beast. Coming up out of the earth. The first beast arose from the sea as we saw in the book of Daniel. Daniel, the four winds of heaven, strove upon the seas, and beasts emerged. These winds striving against seas represent wars and conflicts out of which nations rise to power. Babylon fell, the Medo-Persian Empire came in, took control, sacked Babylon, in war and took control. Greece came in, had war, sacked Persia, took power. Rome, same thing. They came in, sacked the world via war and rose to power. Nations rise to power through war. But there's another beast that rises up not out of the sea as a result of war. This beast rises up from the earth. So from a seemingly uninhabitable land, a beast, another nation, rises up that had the appearance of a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. And this beast had two horns. Horns represent authority in scripture. That's what horns represent. But no, the other kingdoms, <laughs> this is good. The other kingdoms that were on the beast in Daniel and in Revelation, they had horns and they had crowns upon the horns. You remember that? They, had, they were ruled by kings. 
this nation has horns, but no crown. So there's a nation that rises up. Watch, now stay with me. That has the appearance of a lamb. Every time lamb is mentioned in the book of Revelation, it's referring to Jesus, except this time. This beast has two horns like a lamb. It appears lamb-like. It has two horns, two forms of government, two forms of authority, two kingdoms inside of one, but no king. But it speaks like a dragon. Now, how does a dragon speak? A dragon speaks through its laws, through its governmental implementation. And we'll see this further as we look at what happened with Rome. Okay, stay with me. So it says, now needless to say, and if you haven't heard any of my previous teaching, my understanding of this lamb-like beast that rises out of the earth is the United States. People say, well, what? but the United States is not a biblical prophecy. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It would only, it, it, not, not only is it biblical, it would only make sense that the most powerful nation in the world would play a prominent role in the final conflict of the people of God on earth, the United States. Stay with me. When this nation, the United States, so renounces, watch this now, its government, its principles of government, as to enact laws, now stay with me, governing acceptable forms of worship. Now, some people may say, oh, that can't happen. Well, y'all obviously really haven't read U.S. history. <laughs> You've gone for the okey-doke version of American history. You obviously are not aware of the religious conflicts that have always been present in America, going back to its very founding, there has always been religious conflict in America. But it says, when this nation so renounces the principles of its government as to enact laws that govern acceptable forms of worship. In other words, it will come to the place where government will establish what is an acceptable form of worship and what isn't. Now, some people say that could never happen in America. Folk, open your eyes. I don't put anything past America. Now, let me say this. I love America. I thank God I was born in, an, in America. I love my country. I've served my country. United States uh, Air Force veteran. So don't don't go off the rails. Okay? And I'm not dealing with conspiracy theories and far right or for, far left agendas. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding and recognizing the kingdom of God over against the kingdom of men. This is what I'm talking about. All right. Now, when this country... <laughs> and that's laws that govern acceptable forms of worship. Now listen, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery or the papacy. Now 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 what am I talking about here? Let me let me define those terms. When we talk about Protestantism and we talk about the papacy, they are two diametrically opposed understandings and principles of worship to God. The reason we had a reformation going back to the 1500s, this is for so many people who consider themselves to be reformed. The reason we had a reformation is because 
Wesley, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Tyndale, and many others recognize the error in the doctrine and the teaching of the papacy. So they protested the abuses of the papal church, the church of Rome, which by the way, papal Rome replaced pagan Rome. We're gonna look at this. Let me say it again. Papal Rome replaced pagan Rome, but it's still Rome is still the same beast. The power was just transferred from papal or pagan Rome to pagan Rome, wherein the Caesars and Caesar's Senate once ruled pagan Rome, the Pope, his cardinals, bishops, archbishops, seized that same power and ruled papal Rome. Hence, the holy wars. You remember the holy wars? The, you remember the crusades, the inquisitions, all of that? Okay, that's papal Rome. That is a false apostate church trying to force its belief, convictions, and creeds upon the masses to, to control them in the name of God and the, the, the result of not accepting the authority was death. That's how the dragon speaks. America, apostate Protestantism, will replicate those abuses, thus making an image to the beast. Y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. I know some people are saying, oh, this is too far-fetched. You know, this is this is some stuff, you know, I guess he got a download or I guess he got, no, no, no. All of the Protestant reformers, all of them taught what I'm teaching now. This is what the reformers understood that is what caused them to go under great persecution from papal Rome. That's why they were branded as heretics. That's why people left the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they fleed from the papacy because it was exposed as being the antichrist system of the book of Revelation via the prophecies of Daniel. Folks, just read some... Just read, just, just read some of the reformers. That's all you have to do. I'm not talking about John MacArthur and some of these Johnny Come Latelys who, you know, who perpetrate the same nonsense. I'm talking about going back, reading Luther, Zwingli, read their understanding of biblical prophecy. And you'll see what was fueling the Reformation. We've forgotten because we have become apostate and we are more like the, 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 the daughters of the harlot, Revelation 17, than we are the bride of Christ, Revelation 12. Okay, let's, let's keep going. I didn't plan to go there, but let me keep going. Protestantism will end this act, join hands with popery. It will be nothing less than giving life to the beast whose deadly wound was healed. We're going to look at this deadly wound in a minute. Giving life back to the tyranny that has long been eagerly watching for an opportunity to spring again into activity. So you said, well, Darrell, what are you saying? I'm saying that the same tyranny that was perpetrated by the papacy beginning in right around uh, 400, 476, 538 AD and continued down to the 1700s when the the wound was inflicted, the deadly wound of Rome. 
See, now, when we talk about this stuff now, when you talk about the abuses and the tyranny and the apostasy of, 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 pap of, of papal Rome, people look at you like you're strange because that's not the picture. That's not the image of the papacy that most of us have. See, see nowadays, because that deadly wound is being healed, people look at the Pope and think he's God on earth, and he's not. The Pope visits nations shut down because the Pope is visiting. The whole world wandered after the beast. Let me keep going. So it says, <laughs> Revelation 13, I saw one of his heads as if it were mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled after the beast. History will repeat itself again. False religion, now, now listen, false religion will again be exalted. That's not, that shouldn't be a far-fetched understanding for anybody nowadays to understand. False religion is, is that, that's the call of the day. Don't, don't give me Bible. Don't, don't give, <laughs> don't give me chapter and verse. Don't give me line upon line. Don't give me solid teaching. Don't give me solid doctrine. Give me a revelation. Give me a download. Give me, give me a prophet who can prophesy smooth things to me, but don't give me scripture. Don't give me what Jesus said. Don't give me what Paul said. Don't give me what Peter said. Don't give me Bible. Because that's just your opinion. Because everybody can interpret the Bible for themselves. Yeah, they can. Under the inspiration and the enlightenment and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the foundational principles of the Reformation. That, that we are free to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. But that doesn't mean we just make the Bible say what we want it to say. That means that we submit ourselves to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we go line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible isn't a book, a mystery. There's mysteries in it. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bible isn't a book. There's some kind of mysterious book locked up in, 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 in the back room of a church. No, that's what that's what the papacy did. Chained the Bible up and then told the people, we're the only ones that can interpret it. So what we say it says, that's what it says. And if you don't accept what we say, you're a heretic. We'll burn you at the stake. We'll hunt you down. Wake up, people. Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. Come out of her, my people, that you be now partaker of her sin. This is all part of the 2024 global reset. So history will repeat itself. False religion will be exalted. <laughs> all nations, tongue, and people will be commanded to worship this false system of religious worship. Now, as America, the, the land, quote unquote, of religious liberty unites with the papacy. Now, you need to understand this. Enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor false religious worship. The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Listen, folk. America hails itself as a Christian nation, right? So if, if you look worldwide and you think about Christianity, people say, well, if you want to, if you want to see a Christian nation, just look to America because America is a Christian nation founded upon the Judeo Christian ethic. No, it wasn't. America was founded upon lies, manipulation, seduction, murder, hatred, slavery. Need I go on? <laughs> now, the people who came to America, 
some of them, were actually coming because they wanted to live in a country that wasn't ruled by a king, and they wanted to belong to a church that wasn't ruled by a pope. Read your American history books. <laughs> this is all I'm saying, folks. What I'm talking about is history. But what I'm attempting to show is all of this history is already given to us and foretold to us through biblical prophecy. I've already said I'm not anti-American. I love being an American, but I worship God. Let me say it again. I love being an American, but I worship God. I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. And so whenever American laws and government and legislations go contrary to scripture, I follow scripture. America was designed to be a nation in which you can do that. It's called freedom of conscience. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, that includes African-Americans, by the way, because see, when they wrote that, we weren't included. But I'm just saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men were created equal in the sight of God and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That being the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are God given liberties. Whenever a nation or a church seek to subvert that principle, you've got a problem. Whenever the church uses the state to enforce its belief, you've got a problem. That's what happened with the papacy. Let me keep going. The question of worship will be the issue in the great final conflict in which all of the world will act apart. Okay. So let me go here. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of the great and decisive actions of the end times. The what? The, 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 the Christian world? Meaning, authority, many in authority, in the Christian world, will enact laws designed to control the conscience after the example of the papacy. Let me say this again. Well, let me say this. This should be a far-fetched idea for many people to understand if you simply look at what's happening in our political system today and who's controlling the arguments in the political system today. It's the Christian right. They call it Christian nationalism. And they are seeking tonight to enact laws that govern people's conscience. That's just, that's, that's just the beginning of the agenda, folks. That's the beginning of the agenda. Okay. So they will enact laws designed to control the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon, this false system, will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's all of the false doctrine, all of the false systems of worship, all of the false understandings of church and state that was implemented in the papacy is going to reemerge again. Folks, it's happening as we speak. Check the roles of your Congress. America is supposed to be a Protestant nation. That's what they say, right? 
It's supposed to be a Protestant nation. Correct? All right. Five, seven, I think we have seven chief justices or eight. The majority, the majority rule on our Supreme Court is Catholic. The majority of legislatures in the Senate, in the Congress, is Catholic, but it's a Protestant nation. If you know anything about Catholicism, their utmost loyalty is to the papacy and the Church of Rome, not political structures. They use political structures to carry out the agenda of the papacy. Oh, folks, listen. <laughs> there will be a universal bond of union, one great har harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces. Why? Because he's going to give their power and strength. This confederacy is going to give their power and their strength unto this beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty. That's the freedom to worship God according to the dictates of your conscience as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. To make the long story short, the state will implement what it deems to be acceptable worship. I'm talking about within Christianity. I mean, we already know if, if, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, if you're anything other than a Christian other in America, you're already looked at as suspect. <laughs> okay. We already know this. Y'all know that. Y'all know that. Okay. Well, it's going to go further than that and it's going to begin to go into what they are deciding is acceptable forms of worship even within Christianity. You say, well, that can't happen. Yes, it can. That's why now I have to say this, like I said in class, I'm not saying I'm pro LGBTQ. I'm not saying I'm pro-life. I'm not saying any of that. All right. I'm using those as an example of what I'm saying. You can be a believer and own a business right and your conscience can say you're not going to sell goods to certain individuals right okay they'll take it to the supreme court and the supreme court will force you say but it's violating my conscience it doesn't matter. This is the ruling of the Supreme Court. Same thing with an abortion. That's the, it's the same issue with abortion. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate people's conscience. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm pro either of them. I'm simply showing how of many of these issues are funneling their way into the courts of justice and they're becoming laws that everyone must abide by. Okay. So here's some cru crucial questions because this is what we know. The deadly wound was healed. I want to look at that before we close. Which weapon did the beast use to slay the saints? What weapon gave the beast its mortal wound? What does the sword symbolize? How and when did the beast acquire the sword that it used to kill? And what is meant by the deadly wound? All right, so let's examine a few of these. And I've got to go pretty quick with this. Because Revelation 13 says this. In the, in, in the midst of talking about the beast, there seems... There seems to be this verse that's dropped in there that it doesn't seem like it, it, it even fits. And it's this. 
<laughs> Verse 10, Revelation 13. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So in the midst of talking about these beasts, all of a sudden, this thing jumps up. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So let's look at this. When the scripture talks about a sword, Let's, let's consider something. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, he begins, the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the believer's armor, right? Verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, now watch, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, have, having the breastplate of righteousness, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The only offensive weapon the church has is the sword, the sword of the spirit. All of the rest of the armor is defensive. So we know in one sense, the sword is representative of the word of God. But there is another sword that is also mentioned in scripture. So let's look at that one. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. And it's interesting that he's writing this to believers in Rome. But well, watch this. Romans chapter 13. And let's read verse. Let's read verses 1 through 4. And Paul is writing instructing believers how to live out their life in the context of everyday culture and everyday society. This is what he says. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. Now, this is talking about the legitimate use of civil governmental power, the rulers that be. There's a reason we have a speed limit, and it's a law. If you break the speed limit and you get a ticket, you're getting a ticket justifiably. There are laws that are implemented that help govern civil society. That is God ordained. So I'm not an anarchist. <laughs> okay. There are laws that are given to govern society. And the laws are in place not to check good, but to check evil. So the only time you have to fear that law is if you're breaking the law. Are you with me? All right, let's keep reading. Verse 4. He, talking about the person that yields that power, is the minister, servant of God to you for good. 
if you do that which is evil, be afraid. Why? Because he bears not the sword in vain. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. What is civil law and civil government referred to as a sword? Now, mind you, this is being written to Roman believers in like the first century. So we know that Rome executed, you know, the Roman garrisons and Roman laws and, and all of that good stuff. They carried them out by their laws and they used weapons known as swords. Do you remember when the Roman legions came to arrest Jesus in the garden, the scripture says, Peter pulled out what? A sword and cut off the servant's ear. Jesus reached down, picked up the man's ear, healed it, put it back together, told Peter to put up the sword. That's not the way we do business. That's not the way that the kingdom operates. The kingdom doesn't operate by that kind of a sword. The kingdom operates by the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But there are two swords. There is the sword of civil power, and there's the sword of the power of the spirit or the kingdom of God. Why? Because there are two kingdoms in conflict. So when Jesus goes before Caesar, who is representing Rome, papal, Caesar asked the question. He said, are you king of the Jews? Jesus says, are you asking me this of your own volition or did somebody tell you about it? Jesus said, don't you know, Pilate says, or, 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 or Pilate, yeah, Pilate says, don't you know that I have the power? To set you free? Jesus said, don't you understand that if I wanted to, I could call, I could, I could, I could pray to the Father. And he said, 10,000 legions of angels to set me free. There are kingdoms in conflict. There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of the enemy. Caesar represents the kingdom of the enemy. Jesus represents the kingdom of God. Two kingdoms who use two different swords to execute the laws of those kingdoms. That's civil and spiritual power. One sword represents civil power. The other sword represents the sword of the spirit or spiritual power, which is the word of God. Are you with me? All right, let's keep going. So what sword did the papacy use to persecute the people of God? Which one? The sword that is mentioned in Romans 13 threatens civil penalties, incarceration, confiscation of goods, fines, death. Remember, in Romans 13, those that don't receive the image of the beast, they can't buy nothing, they can't sell, they can't trade, their commerce is cut off. Okay. The passage makes it clear that in the time of the Apostle Paul, the particular sword, civil power, did not belong to the church. It belonged to the Roman state. That sword is punitive. It's for punishment. It's not persuasive as the word of God. That's the sword that papal Rome used to persecute the people of God during the 1260 years of persecution. Remember, the papacy, the Church of Rome, is a state and it is a church. That's why they have Vatican city. It's a church, but it's also a state. That's what they got their own police force. They got their own military. They, get, they have everything every other nation has. So the Pope yields both civil and religious power. And it's all confined in the papacy. Y'all stay with me. Now, it is true. God established both. 
he established civil power and he established spiritual power. He established the church. He established the state. What are the two governing authorities or kingdoms present in the United States? We have what's called the separation of church and state. Why? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. Why not? Because we know what that leads to. The founding fathers understood what happens when you mix church and state. They experienced it from the Church of England and they experienced it from the Church of Rome. They don't want a king calling the shots for church and they don't want a pope or a religious figure calling shots for the state. That's the papacy. So when they set up this nation, it was specifically set up to keep those powers separate. What we are witnessing today is the union of the two. That's why there's, there's big arguments today uh, coming out of a lot of Christian right circles that the idea of the separation of church and state is a fallacy. They're saying there is no, that's not what the founding fathers uh, uh, meant when they said the separation of church and state. They didn't mean that the church shouldn't influence the state. They meant that the state shouldn't influence the church. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we put all of these religious figures into governmental powers to carry out their whims of what they believe the church should do. And then they make it law and then they use civil law to punish spiritual non-submissive individuals. <laughs>